Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our opening prayer this morning is from Tom Thompson in Colorado. Tom. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for this time together with friends from all over the world, Lord. And just pray that you would be with each person, guide and direct them, lift them up through your spirit, Lord. Be with Bart as he leads us. Be with Craig as he brings a message to us, Lord. Guide his words and give him strength and encouragement. Thank you for the rest of this day. Guide us, direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy long weekend for those in America. Hope you have a nice, safe weekend. Um, our bright spot today is going to be from our friends, the Reedsons in Malawi, who just got back from a special weekend. So we'll have them share. Hello, House Church. Uh, we are having a bright spot uh, for the trip we had, both of us. Uh, we had a successful trip uh, last Friday, going to Lirongwe. It's uh, a trip of six or five and a half hours. We had this trip to Lilongwe because uh, I had an access of uh, doing a course of monitoring and evaluation management course uh, in Lilongwe. That is in uh, that was in March, if not, if not February. So I attended that course for a month. So after the training, we were waiting for the graduation. Then the lectures set the date for the graduation. So when they announced, uh, Jason and uh, wife Alana uh, helped to meet what was required for us to travel. And uh, uh, Dawn did not even hesitate when she received that money she lashed and sent the Western Union to my boss, my financial director here. Then uh, we started off. It was a good trip. One, because uh, she has been having a lot of worries in her life. So when we were traveling, when I, we come across the mountain, I was showing and tell the name of the mountain. And uh, whatever I was seeing on the road, I was trying to wake up, to wake her up. So she was smiling along with the road. Uh, a lot of kiddings. So where the graduation was happening, even myself, it was my first time. We, though we spent much of our time asking to be there after we dropped at a bus depot. Fortunately, we arrived there. So we saw the new building built by Chinese people called Golden Peacock, five star. We arrived there. Since it was her first time, my friend here, to be on a elevator, I was trying to hold her well. She was doing this here and there. <laughs> so it was good. She was smiling, so happy. Good. <laughs> Up to the time we reached the place of graduation, uh, the program started. I was given a chance to speak for my experience. I shared, and uh, yeah, it was good experience because the guest of honor there was a director of partners in Hope and the other chief executive <laughs> officers. So I had to explain what I went through, what is happening. Even I had time to talk about DI and uh, its directors on what is happening here in Malawi. So they are happy on what we are doing. They are happy 
with DI and house church and what I learned and this application. Yeah, people were rotating, clapping hands. So they were saying, this is wonderful. So we are wishing you well in the ministry. So after that, we had a good uh, food. As you saw in the picture, everything went on well. Thank you everyone for your players. Thank you, God bless you. Okay, Mervis, you're awfully quiet there. We need to know just one little thing. What was your favorite part of the trip? Besides being with Patrick. <laughs> okay. Uh, first thing that I visited uh, a place where I never even dreamed that I can be there. It was like a miracle to my side. I have never been joy like that before. It was good and great. Uh, a strange thing, another thing I have seen there. I have seen a, a, a Hello. I saw a round big table whereby I can call them the ushers, the working mate of there. They were bringing food, fruit, and they were putting on that round table. But what shocks me was that they were using a remote, like TV remote. When they used the remote, the table was moving around. So I was surprised because it was the first time for me <laughs> to experience that. I said, wow, what is going on? How come the table can move without anyone pushing, pushing it, only using a remote? So, <laughs> so it was strange and moving, uh, uh, moving down from the upstairs, moving down without stepping out something just to push you down and push me up. So I was holding something like this. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. It's really good to see you smiling, Mervis. And, and I'm, I'm grateful. So yes, I'm grateful that you were able to go and celebrate that graduation. Thank you for wonderful. sharing. Thank you. Okay, now we're just gonna move a little bit north and west of Malawi, and we're gonna to go to the Democratic Republic of Congo where Naomi is going to bless us this morning with a song. Make sure you're unmuted, thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Naomi is going to sing in French and uh, the title of uh, the, the song is, uh, there is more joy to give than to be given. There is more, jo more joy to give than to be given. Mm. That is the title of the song. Go ahead, mm. Naomi. Il a plus de joie, plus de joie à donner. Il a plus de joie à donner, à donner. Je suis affamé, pourquoi dit-il a frié? Je suis affamé, il m'a fermé la porte. Peut-être je fais amour, passer les nuits. Peut-être je fais amour, pas charité. Il a plus de jours, plus de jours à donner. Il a plus de jours à donner, à donner que les Je suis affamé, pourquoi dit-il a frié? Je suis affamé, il m'a fermé la porte, pas tant jour par Thank 
Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. That was such a blessing to all of us. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to have Johnny reading our prayers for us this morning. And Johnny, before you begin, here is our quote for today. And our quote comes with a beautiful display of flowers. I want you to see our flowers from our flower guild lady, Joan. Thank you. I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. Victor Frankl. Thanks, Joan. That was awesome. <laughs> and <clears throat> thank you, Flavia and Naomi, for your beautiful song, and uh, Patrick and Marvis for your beautiful story. <laughs> Guys, there's a lot of prayer requests and some praises today. Um, it's awesome that we can uh, have our answered prayers in one section. So um, when your prayers get answered, let us know so we can put them on this list and encourage each other. And if you have prayer requests, please send them to me or Bart or Don or Heidi. We love you guys. We love praying for you. Um, please just pray with me this morning as a fellow kingdom person who we all just stand in the place of pain of our world and we stand in the gap between our world and God. And that's a high calling. So let's do that. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters here. Just thank you that you heal us. You've kept us well. And I just pray for continue, like that to continue. Thank you for Craig, that he's going to speak to us this morning. Just be with him and just open our ears and hearts this morning. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for Tawana, who had a successful surgery on Friday and is recovering well. From Mary O'Flaherty, who's recovering well from her recent concussion. Thank you, Jesus. For Flavian, who's back serving the Lord at 100% after suffering from malaria and the flu. Thank you for healing him, Lord. For Rachel, Joan Arnold's daughter, who's doing much better with her chemotherapy treatment. For Patrick and Mervis who got a way to celebrate Patrick's completion of leadership training. Thank you for that blessed time, Lord. For Carly, Bart and Don's daughter and her family who moved into military housing in Germany. Thank you for giving them a place. For Disciples International and all who served and support our missionaries in DRC and Malawi. Yes, Jesus, praise you. For this morning, we just come and we pray for safe passage of those fleeing Afghanistan and protection of those who remain. For those who experience loss from Hurricane Ida to recover and heal from the effects. For safety and success of firefighters in California, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Lord, for Darlene Weiss, in her ongoing recovery after a terrible car accident four years ago. Jesus, we lift her up to you. For my sister Grace to stay well during the COVID outbreak at her nursing facility. And Jesus, just bless all the other staff and residents there. For two-year-old Silas to be completely healthy before his major surgery on the 10th. For Edward Reedson, who's hoping for a job with the Malawi Police Department. We're just blessed that situation. Lord, we pray for your love to work in and through us, just touching those we encounter each day. In the name of Jesus. 
join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our first scripture reader is going to be Flavian in the DRC. Thank you, Flavian. Flavian, make sure you're unmuted. Thank you, Mother Don. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 17. Verse 1 through 9. God said to Abraham, This is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you, uh, after you for the, gener the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now a now lion. I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendant after you. And I will be thy God, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the, the, the generations to come. And the second thing is from Acts chapter 11, verse 1 through 5, and the verse 15 to 18. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believer criticized him, saying, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely and uh, I precisely as it had happened. He concluded by saying, the Holy Spirit came upon them as uh, he had come upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted the following, please. The following spellings, I cannot see it. Thank you for the readings and for the Thank song, you. Naomi, and for the bright spot. And now I'm going to turn it over to Craig Kennedy in Florida to bring us the message. Craig. Good morning, House Church, and God bless you. I'm just going to share today what the Lord has shared with me all week. It's been a true blessing for me to be in the word and to be listening 
to Jesus. And the first thing I'd like to say is Mark did a fantastic job on chapter 10, didn't he? And, you know, as we look back at chapter 10, I think of this divine appointment. I mean, this is incredible that two people in two different places were called by God for this action to take place. And there was a powerful, powerful message where Peter went and talked to Cornelius and ate with him and ultimately led him to the Lord and many others. Well, now in chapter 11, he, he's got to go back home. And them folks at home already heard about what he did. It said in uh, chapter 11, verse 1, now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judah heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And they weren't real happy about it. In fact, they were a little twisted. They didn't think it was right. They didn't mind him just talking to them about Jesus. But to sit down and eat with them, man, that was totally wrong in their eyes. But all they could do is explain to them what was explained to him. And that's what this passage is all about. He's telling them exactly how it went down. Well, you know, being a Jewish kid, I, I can kind of relate to this a little bit, but my last name's Kennedy, and I got blonde hair and blue eyes. What kind of Jew are you? Well, in 1966, my dad was in the Air Force. See, what happened was my dad was Robert Kennedy from Stratton, Pennsylvania, and my mom was Judah Solomon from Brooklyn, New York. So I'm half Irish Catholic and half Jewish as far as the lineage goes. So we get to Brooklyn, New York in 1960. I guess it's closer to 66. I think it was 66 or 67. Would have made me about eight years old. And I don't remember a whole lot about eight years old, but I remember this. So my grandparents kept a kosher home. So the first thing they did was put a yarmulke on my head and showed me how to put a talus around my shoulders and how to tuck it in and keep the tails out. So people can see them. And if you ever got to pray, you can just reach down and grab the end of that talus and you can kiss the string. And those strings symbolize the 12 tribes. So, all right, you know, I'll do whatever you want me to do. The hard part was they want me to go to school like that. Man, school wasn't good. <laughs> Them Jewish kids were like, what are you doing, man? Why do you want to be a Jew? You don't look like a Jew. And the Italian kids were even worse. Well, kind of dealing with all that, you know, and, and basically we lived in a Jewish, Italian, and Irish neighborhood. And the thing is, is they like to play stickball in the streets in Brooklyn, New York. And they put people online, they decide who's going to play. And it was always the Jews against the Italians, or the Jews against the Irish, or the Irish against the Italians. Well, I never got picked. Mm -hmm. I never got to play. Mm -hmm. I never truly fit in. There was this one kid, his name was Andy Klein. He lived in the building and he tried his hardest to get them kids to, expect, uh, to accept me. He'd say, you know who he is? That's uh, Judith Solomon's son. That's Harry Solomon's and Ruth Solomon's grandson. That's Rabbi Brecca's great grandson. And he's the man that started the temple. Well, it didn't work. Wasn't enough. So I was never accepted, and, and I, I didn't pass school that year. I, I was held back. But that goes so much along with this passage, it just blew me away, right? I had a young man trying to justify the fact that I was Jewish, but they didn't believe it. They don't want no part of it. So when Peter goes back home, to Jerusalem, that's what he's got to deal with. He's got to deal with all these circumcised Jewish folks saying, what are you doing, man? Them folks ain't in the tribe. Them folks ain't Jew. They ain't been circumcised. Now, maybe we'll let them in, but they got to be Jewish first. They got to understand the rituals. They got to understand all about Abraham, like we read in that first passage, that they were descendants of Abraham. So Peter broke it down for him and explained it to him. 
and they came to a point where they understood it. You know, I, I was a little older and uh, I was in Halleberg, Germany and my wife was in Bosnia. So my job was to take care of them youngins, but I still like to play golf. So I was on the golf course one day playing with these guys and you know, men, they always want to know what you do sooner or later, right? They, it's important to them what you do. Well, there were some ladies playing ahead of us and they were kind of playing slow. And one of the men said, man, them ladies must have got their dishes done early today. Mm. We usually play ahead of them. Well, about the sixth hole, they finally got around to it. So, hey, man, what do you do for work? I said, well, I normally play with them ladies ahead of us, but I didn't get my dishes done early. <laughs> well, they never invited me to play with them again. <laughs> it was a one-time deal, man, because I wasn't up to their standards, see? That's the beauty of Christ, isn't it, really? I mean, he came down to this earth, and he, and he lived amongst us, and he witnessed to all. He didn't just witness to the Jews. Throughout the scriptures, you see him witnessing to Gentiles, like the lady at the well. And... and when he went to that cross and died, that's the Lamb of God, man. That's the ultimate sacrifice, and he died for all of us, every single one of us. Whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a Greek, it doesn't matter as long as you just trust and believe in him. And he tells us that. He tells us that in the word. He tells us that. Well, I can't find it, but he tells us that. How about that? <laughs> well, here's here's another thing about it is uh, once I got saved, once I came to the place, and it wasn't easy for me. In fact, it was pretty hard for me. Um, coming from the Jewish background, had all that teaching that Jesus wasn't the son of God. And in fact, they didn't want us even reading the New Testament. You could read the Torah. You could read all about Moses, but uh, you couldn't read the New Testament. And you know, Jewish people, they don't evangelize. There ain't but one way to be a Jew. As far as the Orthodox are concerned, if you ain't born a Jew, there ain't no getting in. So when I came to faith, I had to tell my folks, you know. Well, there was this organization called Jews for Jesus. I heard about them. So I thought that would be a wonderful way to break it down and share with my mom. So I called her on the phone from Germany and I said, mom, have you ever heard of an organization called Jews for Jesus? She says, there ain't no such thing, honey. It's like being a little bit pregnant. Either you are or you're not. And then she went on to say, why in the world would you want to be a Christian? Why? Hadn't our God been good enough to us? Hasn't our God delivered our family from Germany during the Holocaust? And I said, Mom, it's the same guy. And she didn't understand it. And there was some fallout. And it took a long time. In fact, I still don't have a relationship with a lot of my cousins. They just don't understand how I can accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I pray for them. I pray for them often. You know? And something else that this is all about, it's all about excluding and including. You know, my wife and I do some uh, homeless stuff on Sundays. We cook up some groceries and we go out on the street and we just talk to folks and look at emotion. We just go out there and talk to folks and uh, feed them a little something, try to make it a good homemade meal, you know. And, and a lot of folks don't see these folks. They see them as unclean, you know. They see them as unworthy, or they don't see them at all. You know, we all have a different circumstance. We've all been through things one way or the other. But in the eyes of God, they're his children, just like we are. And I think we're called to love them. And it ain't always easy to love them. 
And I think the reason why I got a heart for them is because I was up underneath the bridge using a rock for a pillow. And every day I'd walk over to Brooks Bridge on the other side, there's a recruiter over there. And he'd say, hey, man, won't you come in the military? And I'm like, I can't get in the military. Well, one night the guy I was laying next to actually died from an overdose and I'd done the same drugs he did. And I didn't die. Well, the next morning that recruiter was there. Hey, are you ready? And that was a wake up call. I said, yeah, man, I'm ready. I don't want to be that guy. So he took me in his home and cleaned me up. His Air Force recruiter. Well, if he'd known my IQ, he probably wouldn't have got me cleaned up. But he took me to take that test and I didn't pass it. So I told him, I said, I knew I couldn't get in. He said, we ain't done yet, son. Well, they took me to the Navy. And I didn't work either. Then the Coast Guard. Well, finally, he took me to the Army. And by the grace of God and the skin of my teeth, I became a truck driver for the United States Army, man. But that guy changed my life. He took a chance on me because he didn't reject me. He accepted me. And that's the word. That's the word that I got from the Lord. And I just wanted to share that with you. And, uh, you know, as we come to communion, we are so blessed that all we got to do, all we got to do is ask him into our life and realize that we're sinners and our sin separates us from him. And then if we repent, he will fill our life. He will change our life as he did mine. So God bless you. And thank you all so much for listening to me today. Thank you, Craig. And for most of you, you had not heard those stories before. I've heard uh, those stories in various forms and many others, but Rick is behind all of them this morning. Mm. Craig is this matter of exclusion or inclusion. And obviously in your life, you experience a lot of exclusion, but along the way here and there, you experienced some inclusion of which you are a part now, part of uh, our lives, Dawn and I for 25 plus years now, you and Sally and your family, but part of the house church community also, which is pretty diverse group. And I think we all have our stories and experiences of what it's like to be excluded and what it feels like to be included. And we're gonna talk about that during our discussion time, but first I, I want us to focus on what brings us all together in the first place and that is the person of jesus christ just as i think uh craig has so personally presented uh and if jesus christ is not our savior then he can't be our lord uh he saves us from what from ourselves and in a lot of ways i think craig as you were sharing that Air Force recruiter, he came by and uh, saved you from yourself and uh, didn't feel like you had to be in his denomination, the Air Force, but in the Army. He was interested in your life. So God is interested in our lives. And he has opened his arms wide, wide to us to include us into his family as his adopted children. This is too awesome for me to really comprehend when I really pause to think about it. And I ought to. We ought to. We need to do that often to think that the infinite, eternal creator, sovereign Lord, holy God, who is perfect in every way, who has created us in his image, distinct in that we are made in his likeness and yet so different and diverse. And we have segregated ourselves in so many ways, and yet he brings us to himself. And the focus is on who we are in him as his image bearers. And he wants us to be part of his family, but he doesn't force us. Have you responded to his invitation? I can only assume that you have because you've tuned in, but I can't be sure. I can only be sure of my own life in Christ, not because of what I have done, but what he has done on my behalf. And that is include me into his family. 
and he did that at a high price. Um, anyone who has been adopted or has adopted children, uh, at least in these days, costs a lot. It's very expensive. Well, God paid the highest price. It cost his life to purchase us and make us his own. And this is what communion is about. So if you have responded to his invitation, if you are part of his family, if you are an adopted son or daughter, you are welcome to the table. But one thing is important. And the Apostle Paul says, make sure that you examine your life and let the Holy Spirit examine your life. Because if you're not right with others, then we're not right with God. So we need to get right. We need to confess our sin and allow him to cleanse us, fill us, and lead us to himself, and then lead us to others. So let us first go to him, the one who saves us by his blood, by remembering his words as he came together in that upper room and he gave new meaning to that ancient tradition. The ancient tradition that was exclusive to Jews only. And he opened the door to us, all people who will come. The new meaning of Passover is that he is our Passover. Jesus in the upper room took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Take this and eat it all of you. And as often as you do this, remember me, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, who makes us one with him. A word about the cup. At the Passover, there are actually four cups that are served. And each cup has meaning. And the cup that Jesus took at that latter part of the Passover meal is the cup of redemption. To redeem means to purchase, to buy it back, to pay the price, to purchase something. And that is what God has done with his life through his blood in the person of Jesus. He has redeemed us. Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood. This is my blood. It is of the new covenant. The new covenant, which is poured out for many Jews and Gentiles, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Take this, all of you, and drink it. And as often as you do this, remember me, our Lord said. Let us remember him, the blood of our Lord Jesus who gives us life. Oh, Father, thank you for the life that you give us in Christ. No greater life, no greater love has anyone than this, than one laid down his life for his friends. Those are your words. But you went beyond those words. You laid down your life for your enemies. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive us when we don't know what we're doing. Help us to do what is right by keeping our eyes on you and walking with you and being grateful to you because of the love poured out for us at your expense on the cross. Thank you. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Craig. Craig told some stories, didn't he? Don't you love to hear stories? See, when we hear stories, <coughs> the text of scripture comes to life. Uh, most of what the Bible is are stories, human stories, God's stories. And when we come together at House Church, we need to share our stories. Thank you, Craig, because now we know you a little bit better. I'd like to hear from some of you. I'd like to hear some of your stories of exclusion. When were you excluded in life and how did that feel? We'll get to the inclusion part, but exclusion. Craig shared someone else. Uh, 
I'll share. In my high school, this was high school, not college, there were three social groups, all girls, and they were all very stuck up. They were all very, well, I, I thought they were because I was excluded. I was, um, I always felt they looked down their nose at me. I guess I wasn't pretty enough or popular enough or whatever. And anyway, those three social groups um, really, um, uh, that's when I really felt excluded. And I remember one day I came home from school and my mother was a education director at our church. And she was concerned about these three social groups that were causing a lot of hurt feelings at our high school. And she was working with the clergy to try to get these girls to sort of change their way. And so I came home from school one day to my ho home, which was, I thought, my sanctuary. This is where I'm safe. And there are all these girls in my living room and my mother and the clergy there trying to work with them. And I felt so betrayed because my mother had invited these people who had rejected me into our home where my sanctuary. And I felt really, really rejected then. So that's my story. Mm. Thank you, Adrian. Sorry about that. <laughs> Someone oh, else. Has story yeah, Aaron. As well. Um, I actually have two of them. So the first one is all throughout high school, I was never invited to any of the, the get togethers or the parties or any of that type of stuff. And I think it was my junior, maybe even my senior year. I was really down about it. And I was talking to one of my friends um, who was included with all those things. And I was like, so what? Do you guys just not like, like me? Or like, why am I never invited? It's like, oh, no, 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 it's, it's the exact opposite. Like, we see how you live your life. I was that Christian person in school, in high school. Everybody knew me as the Christian guy. And she said, the reason that we never invite you to any of this stuff is because we see how you live your life and, and we make mistakes and, and we make wrong decisions and do things that don't line up with how you live your life. And we don't want you to get... Um, brought around that type of environment wow. so they were actually being more of a friend to me which was really awesome um and then the other time was and so there was a large jewish community in my school and because i was so outspoken about my faith i had three giant crosses that i wore around my neck so that people couldn't ask me questions i could tell them about jesus and for one year i wore three watches um, on my arm. So people would say, why were you wearing three watches? I said, well, one's for me. I don't remember what the other one was for. And then I said, the other one's for my best friend. Who's your best friend? My best friend's Jesus. So I can always remember him. Um, but because I was so spoken about my faith, some random person started a, a rumor that I hated everybody that was Jewish because they didn't believe that Jesus was Christ. And I wanted them all to go to hell. So for... <laughs> a good like month or so i was very excluded um told that i definitely need to watch my back but one of my friends who i'd known for a couple of years who was very um devout practicing jewish knew that that wasn't the case knew my character and he was able to reach out to the jewish community and get me included back in which was really nice mm. wow thanks for sharing there and somebody else yeah. So as long as we're on a high school roll. <laughs> so I moved from Kansas to Seattle, Washington, my sophomore year of high school, and I kind of blended in. Um, there, there wasn't any big significant thing that I had done. And I had a lot of nice friends. And my senior year, you were allowed to go, if you had good enough grades, you were allowed to not go to school your senior year at the campus, but you could go to a college and take what I took was medical technology courses for the whole day. And I had to tap into the school once a day. So it was around October and I showed up at school and everybody was congratulating me. And I said, why? What, what, are you, what did I do? And they said, well, you've been nominated for homecoming queen. And I was like, what? I don't even know that many people. And we had almost 700 people at our school. 
So I'm just going back and forth to school and life goes on. About six weeks later, I show up and they said, congratulations, you won homecoming queen. And I was like, what? I don't know anybody. So then the following months, I became the most hated person at that school. I had not changed, but it was because I was the homecoming queen. So much so that when the yearbook came out in the spring under my homecoming picture, and the whole court, it said, wolves in sheep's clothing. I have that book today. And it just, you know, it, I realized it wasn't me. It was other people that were feeling, I don't know, rejected because of what I got. But I was totally humble through the whole thing. But it really did hurt so much so that I went up to the person that put my name in the yearbook and um they didn't believe they thought we were all just a bunch of fake people. So that's my wonderful high school story. Mm. Wow. As yeah, I'm, Heather. As I'm, I don't have a story to share, but just a thought about the stories that we've heard. I think it's so interesting that at a time in our lives, we've heard three stories now when folks are in high school, where that's that time frame is when people are trying to figure out their identity and who they are. Yeah. And it's very interesting that that period of time in so many people's lives, you know, the, the enemy, but God would put us in situations that would really challenge us to sort of ask ourselves, who are we? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I just, I was yeah. listening to everybody's stories and it's interesting that. It's, well, it, it is interesting. And we're going to switch over to the inclusion stories. Those are the good stories. Um, but to hear some of these very dramatic experiences for some, but mine, and I just want to share, this is a middle school. So this is before high school. And just how impactful something that may seem so benign. And it's one of those things that your friends may hear about and they say, that's dumb. What's the matter with you? But no kidding. I was a very shy uh, kind of kid growing up. And uh, we had the parties, uh, uh, junior high parties. And I would go to the parties and I would be the wallflower, just kind of waiting for an opportunity to finally get up the, uh, the courage to ask someone to dance, okay? Finally, in the eighth grade, I got the courage to ask a girl to dance. So I did. And she said, no. Okay, so like a big deal. Well, it was such a big deal to me, folks. <laughs> and this is how some people take exclusion. I never went to another party in the eighth, the ninth, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th grade. I didn't date anybody. I wasn't interested in getting hurt again, excluded once. That's a bummer. I'm not going to take that chance again. So you see, I mean, how impactful it is. Okay, so I'm a thin skin guy. <laughs> and maybe that's why my love language number one, I wouldn't pick it to be but I think it is is words of affirmation. Why? I mean, so when those words are not coming, we're not getting affirmed, and we feel excluded, it can be really devastating. I mean, the stories that, uh, you know, Adrian, you're sharing, or Dawn, or, you know, uh, Aaron, compared to mine, but it's the feeling of exclusion. So let's talk about inclusion. When were you included? By God? When did you feel that God included you? And he may have done that through an experience through another person, by whatever means, share. Story of inclusion. Well, I've already shared, but you know, when I got saved in Bosnia, when Sally was in Bosnia, after I got kind of kicked to the curb by all my family, um, I got involved with the chapel and I got involved with the hospitality house ministry. And man, I was on fire for the Lord. I mean, I just couldn't get enough, man. I was reading them Bibles and I was just telling everybody I knew I could about Jesus. In fact, my wife was in Bosnia, so I got on the phone. And, you know, back then you had to talk Hotel Alpha, Papa, Papa, Yankee. And the other guy had to decipher it. Well, I, uh, the first thing I did was I asked her to marry me. Well, I told her I was saved first. She said, are you all right? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm all right. I didn't get hit by a truck or nothing. I just met Jesus. But, but will you marry me? And she said, yes, because I, up to that point, 
I didn't love her like I could love her now that I know Jesus. And we had a Christian fellowship potluck wedding. And the, and the reception was at the ACS building. I mean, it was a big thing. Bart officiated it. I was a Protestant coordinator by now, so I had a relationship with all the guys that did praise and worship. Man, we flat filled that chapel up. But you talking about love? Man, I was a baby Christian. I got baptized there. And everybody just loved me, spent time with me. It showed Jesus. And that was the most included I've ever felt in my life. <laughs> yeah i have an inclusion story uh mine's a high school story but when i was in ninth grade um the lord really put it on my heart that i was to go to england for a year and my dad's from england his whole family's in england he's the only one in america um so you know i had family over there and we'd go visit but i really just felt that i was supposed to go live there for a year and experience life so i asked my parents initially they said no um, but I just was very persistent, left notes everywhere. And there, you know, I wrote on their mirror in their bathroom and the car and the fridge. I had notes everywhere. And so after months of that, they, they were like, okay, maybe, you know, there's something to this. So they finally said yes. And so in August, um, my mom and dad uh, went over there with me. Um, now my dad's family is not saved. They're the church of England. So they, you know, my dad always said when he went to church, it wasn't how much you put in the offering baskets, how much you could take out without being caught. Um, so anyway, my mom, you know, was very nervous about sending me over there for a year, especially if it wasn't going to be, you know, Christ centered environment. So but they they knew I could go. So I went. Um, the first thing on the agenda was to find a church that I could go to um, and New Life Christian Fellowship The people. My mom found a church. This wonderful older couple, uh, Pete and Mervis, lived right across the street from my grand and granddad. Um, so we went over there, met them. They took me to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. Um, so I got, you know, I started going to church there. And then my mom got me in school before she went back to uh, California. The school I got set up there, uh, Robert Patterson School, the entire year, because I was this new girl from California, which I'm from the desert of California. Um, <laughs> I was so included and everybody that entire year, my 10th grade year wanted to know me, be my friend and include me, not just at my, my school friends, my church friends, all of my family that was over there. It was just an incredible year of inclusion. And it really has shaped so much of my life because I'm still friends with my friends from school, from church and my family. Um, it was a year unlike any other. And then of course the year was over and I went back to the desert I was like, wow, what just happened? Um, and then I joined the army. So, but yeah, that, that year was an incredible inclusion year. So. Oh, thank you for sharing that one, Heather. Do we have one more? Yes, I have one more. All right. So um, I'll see if I can, can tell this. When I was in the high school, I was one of two Christians in the entire school. So I didn't have any group that I actually belonged to. Um, I just fit in and was friends with everybody. And it was hard for me. And I remember one time, in the, it was at the end of the day and everything was wrapping up and I was sitting there by myself. I was the only one. And I saw all these groups of other people sitting and talking. And I was like, why am I even here? And I had literally given up on life. I decided, all right, when I get home, that's it. I'm done. And I made the decision to commit suicide. And I was contemplating how am I going to do it? And all of a sudden, from the far corner of the room, one of the girls stopped mid-sentence, walked over to where I was, gave me a big hug and smile and went back. And I was like, wow, God, you, you included me. I was like, all these other groups, these other cliques, they don't matter because you matter. And it was a huge inclusion time in my life where I felt like the Lord included me. So that's my, Inclusions. <laughs> well, nothing more to be said there. Thank you.
uh, Aaron. I, you know, it, I've noticed that since we went to our discussion time this time, nobody's nobody checked out. Everybody stayed on hearing stories. We're getting to know one another. Uh, personal stories uh, as deep and uh, moving as what you just heard from Aaron and the others. Um, hey, Bart. Yeah. I thought I saw Patrick's hand up too. I'd love to hear a story if he has one. Patrick. 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 Do you have one? Yeah. Uh, one short one. I saw inclusion because he, we were rejected since we received the call as pastors. So I saw inclusion the time we received the letter from Bart and Michael that they are coming in Malawi. So we notified the church and we saw people accompanying us at the airport from the church. So we saw a celebration of people. Others, we were related with them, but they were dancing, uh, celebrating Jesus, seeing our friends from America uh, with us. So I saw that there was inclusion of, uh, from God because of what happened that day. So we do feel being included in the ministry because people now can hear what the Lord is doing through us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Patrick. And I'm going to close with just a, a caveat on that story that Patrick shared. That was the first time that we actually met. I didn't know Patrick or Mervis. Landed at the airport in Blantyre. It was a completely new environment for me and Michael, although Michael had been associating with Patrick. Um, Malawi is a very poor country, and it couldn't be more different than America. And if, uh, if you want to look out of place, then look at me and then think of Malawi, and uh, it couldn't be more different. And so when we came through, and we were late. We didn't just see Patrick and Mervis, and I didn't even really know what they looked like at this point, but there they were with about 25 people from their church singing. They sang for us there. We loaded up into two vehicles to go to where Michael and I were going to stay. They sang all the way there. When we got there in the parking lot, they sang all the way there. They were immensely grateful. And folks, at this time, we had not donated one cent. I didn't know them. We were just coming out to see what they were about after Michael had spent two years online discipling Patrick. Talk about feeling welcome. That was a message recently. And talk about feeling included. Thank you, Patrick. Mervis, thank you all. Thank you for this intimate experience of house church. I'm going to ask Dawn to close us out because she prays better than I do. And that's not true, but I usually cry. Lord, I just thank you for this beautiful morning. And we have been so blessed from people all around the world. It's such a gift to us. I thank you for technology and for the minds that make these things happen. I pray for each person that is present here, Lord, that you would bless them this day with good health, with safety, and with contentment and inclusion. We mm -hmm. thank you so much, Lord, that you love us and um, care so much about the littlest details in our lives. We're just so grateful, Lord. We're grateful for this church. We're grateful for these people. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. We love you all. Amen. We love you all. Have a great Thanks, day. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Beautiful service. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.